the eye. Once upon a time, a troll sitting on the mountaintop fell over backwards and made a hole in the earth in this lake. Though that was long before the little red houses or the paintings of Munch or the plays of Ibsen or the three billy goats gruff or me. My thoughts were full of what was hidden in the landscape and what was hidden in the mind as I rode by the lake at Sobu and the Vale of Tidalen and came up the mountain and above the tree line to the copper mining town of Roros. Roros is a contrary sort of place, being built almost entirely of wood in a land of stone. Norwegians, too, are not as obvious as they seem, for they keep their anxieties within the endurance they've had to learn from their hard country. They're rather like the mountain trolls in the children's stories, whose outsides are made of rock, but if a gleam of sunlight touches them, they explode. Each nation gets the ghosts it deserves. Overcrowded Britain, for instance, has ghosts of people. They're often so human that they even belong to the upper classes. But most Norwegian trolls are either superhuman, like the landscape, or their warnings of human failure in the struggle to hold on to civilization. They contain guilt, loneliness, secret thoughts and dreams. This is all in the past, of course. Modern Norwegians don't see trolls. Though the trolls do get them just the same. In the wilderness, a troll can be as vague as a difficult journey, a gnarled tree, a winding stream. There are water spirits that drown people and have the power of changing into white horses. But my personal project was to do with the three billy goats gruff, who, if you remember, had to put up with a certain amount of aggro from a troll who lived under a bridge. Now, I knew that Norway had goats, and it seemed to me that it was a shame that in the whole country there shouldn't be a single bridge with a troll living underneath it. He was just an ordinary troll from a souvenir shop, because they sell all kinds to amuse the tourists. But it's odd. I don't think people usually make grotesques because they love grotesqueness. They make them as totems of what they fear. I went into the hall of the mountain king, like Ibsen's hero, Peer Gint, who saw the great troll's daughter dancing in the likeness of a pig to the music of her sister in the likeness of a cow, and decided that he wouldn't marry her after all. In my hall of the mountain king, the king had been copper, but the king was dead. I was in the Olaf mine, which is no longer worked. Norway would soon be gone, for after 
before us, I would come onto the old copper road that runs to the great Swedish mine at Farland. Though before I got to Sweden, I would have to cross many miles of no man's land. It seems impossible that there should be people living and working on the high fells. Reindeer, perhaps, but hardly people. But where the reindeer go, the Sami follow. Sami being the lap name for laps. The word has associations of wandering and loss, perhaps in remembrance of another homeland from which they came a long, long time ago. The problem with following reindeer, however, is that you have to find them first. They're snooty creatures and willfully evasive. Apparently something like one in four lap words are to do with reindeer. Swear words, I expect. The trolls of loneliness were out in force as I came over the highlands. It felt wet and cold and even a little dangerous. I'd climbed 4,000 feet, 1,000 meters and more, and springtime had stayed where it was more comfortable, on the coast. The road got to the point where there was no particular reason for having a road any longer, and stopped. A gravel track stretched ahead. Cars had to pay a toll, bicycles were free. I don't think they were expecting me. Reindeer, perhaps, but not cyclists. So the house of Ellen Bull Jonasson and her family was all the more welcome. It was, I'd been told, by way of being a summer house. Well, well, I thought. These laps weren't dress up and sell things to the tourists laps. They were workaday laps with a snow scooter to get to the reindeer in winter and a car to get to the snow scooter from town. The house reminded me of David Copperfield, of the Peggotty family who lived in an upturned boat. Hey. 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 Come in. Thank you, thank you. Is the dog allowed in? Yes. Well, he's in already. Mm. It's a wonderful house. Do you think so? Yes, I do, actually. Mm. How old is it? It's built in 1977. 1977? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not so very old. It looks as if it was mm. built in 1877. <laughs> yeah. And who built it? My father-in-law and my man. This is a special place because uh, I think Ellen and her family are the only one in this this era. They had a family living this way, and um, no one uh, know about it. I learned much about that this year because I've been in Trondheim at a school, and uh, when I tell them that there are lap people in southern Norway, they just are they really? They they don't know it. What's special about being with laps? Here, I'm together with people that speak the language, the lap language, and uh, 
together with the reindeers and we are outside and we don't follow the clock we just we are free and uh, in town and at school I, it's the routine it's, it's another life yes when you talk about the reindeer it is almost as if they were as important as the people yes they are the the reindeer we will live for that's that's our money <laughs> <laughs> They move from summer to the winter place, and then they move from the winter place to the summer place, and then we follow them. But that's only a week, maybe, that we follow them. And in the winter, we stay together with the reindeer. Uh, it makes me angry when they say that, that we are not allowed to be here with the reindeers, that we have to go away. They want to... Uh, mountains self. Who says that? Well, the farmers and other people. Because you think you you were here first and these are your mountains? Yes. For the reindeer. <laughs> yes, that's so. Uh, if the reindeer go across a border, even if it's the Russian border, don't the Sami follow? What do the people at the border say? The customs man. <laughs> I don't think that there is a custom on top of the hill at 1,000 meter. <laughs> and uh, no, he doesn't say anything. Mm. I must have coffee. <laughs> must have coffee, yes, yes. Do you want? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Anna. Perhaps you want some good. reindeer meat, the coffee? Uh, in the coffee. In the coffee. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, please. Yes, <laughs> Can I show it? Is, <laughs> is that something? Yeah, yes, yes, thank it, you. Uh, and, and it's going to melt. Yes. Thank you. That's lovely. So I have to. It's a bit like spaghetti. Quite difficult. What do you think? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that I could ever get quite used to it. <laughs> <laughs> you do this a lot. Yeah, it's really like that. Mm. This is very special for us Sami people. Well, it's very unusual. Is that salted? Yes, it's salted and dried outside Salt. for some weeks. How much reindeer do you actually eat? Well, we eat very much, every day, almost every day. And once a day? Yeah, well, yeah. in morning and, and dinner. So twice a day, uh, mm. every day of your life you eat reindeer? No, not every day perhaps, but almost mm. every day. Mm. That's a beautiful knife, that one. That, uh, who made that? My father-in-law. Is that a traditional pattern that there is on yes. it? For me, it's very important to keep the old traditions. Uh, would you live another sort of life? No, I wouldn't. Why not? Because I'm proud of being a Sami woman, and I love the life I live. It is very natural for me. And so, which comes first, to be a Sami or to be a Norwegian? To be a Sami for me. At last, I came down into the warmth again, and into Sweden. And it was true, there was no customs post at a thousand meters by the way that I came. Nor was there any frontier in the air to stop the fallout from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster that fell on the reindeer moss and was eaten by the reindeer and contaminated them with the radioactive cesium-137. But neither I nor Ellen knew that then. For her, that was a new kind of troll, but for me, it was only summer that was coming. The air was clear, the water crystal. This forest is forever, I thought.
I should have known better. I saw them lining Skorn Lake to the south. Chemical smoke flies through from Germany and across the North Sea from Britain to fall on Scandinavia as acid rain. As an unwilling accomplice to polluting somebody else's forests, I must say that I find it embarrassing. The line may help for this year, perhaps even for as much as five years, and then they'll have to do it again. It treats the symptoms rather than the disease. You don't notice acidity at first. The fish eggs and the small fry die, but the big fish remain, until one day they're gone too, and the water is suddenly barren. Acid rain makes beautiful lakes, crystal clear, with the ultimate clarity of death. For myself, I prefer more traditional ways of smoking fish. Margareta Stenud keeps a family restaurant at Björnleden, near Storsetten. It's a family restaurant because all the family help with it. And it's also a forest restaurant because that's where most of the flavours and most of the food comes from. Juniper branches to perfume the char, whose relatives are still happy in her nearby lakes. So, what do you have on your menu then? What, what could you give me for dinner tonight, which I wouldn't get in London if I was to ask you? We have several things from the forest here: the elk meat and reindeer meat and. Yeah. So. No, uh, you, you you must have this. I see. I'm but not doing very well. I'm not. I'm not very round, am I? Always so, for the, the beginning. So, what are all these meats like? Beaver and uh, elk and reindeer. What do they taste like? Oh, uh, elk tastes like um, very nice beef. Uh -huh. It's not a special uh, wild taste. I don't think so. And reindeer is a little special. So it's a bit gamey, yes, reindeer. Yes. Yeah. So we never use beef here. We have elk meat for everything, even if you make uh, Meatballs and uh, yes, everything. So, how do you get all these? I mean, do you hunt for them or what? No, the reindeer meat you have to have connections with the, the laps. And uh, in September, they, they phoned me and asked me how many do you want. And, and how many do you want? Yeah, six to ten, because it's a lot of work to. Uh, You're telling uh, me. I mean, they're, they're the size of a small cow, aren't they? I mean, or a. Oh, a but big the reindeer, sheep. yes, but the elf is about 200 kilos. So 200 kilos? 400, over 400 pounds? Mm -hmm. Oh, you wouldn't want to run into one of those in a car, No, you, 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 oh, you should be lucky. Do people ever run into them? Yes. Coming along quite nicely. And, uh... So, oh, 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 a moment. Could you I please... I had to, yes. yes uh, but, but could you please... Ah. I had to... To, uh, to brush it? Yes, oh, okay. brush. Oh, well, perhaps the next time I try, I'll get it right. So, uh, can, yes. Uh, you certainly very quick means of making um, bread. Has it got yeast in it? No, yes, I, I had to, to learn when I came here because I'm from the south part of Sweden and we never do like this. And here, that's ordinary butter. And this, it's from a goat. It's we, from a goat? Yes. It looks as if it might be from a goat. Yes. So we make so and then no. there. Good butter. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Mmm. It's very good. It's a bit like, um, slightly... No, it's almost cheese-like. Yeah, it's sugary, isn't it? No, very good. And so, this elk, then, I mean, when you get it, it, it it's that big, is it? <laughs> yes, it, it's even bigger if, if I have the whole animal, but I, no. I have it, I got it in four different pieces. So two in the front and 
yeah. till from the back, and, and then I cut it into smaller so pieces. You must spend your entire life cutting up things for the deep freeze. I mean, two and a half or three <laughs> out. But it must be wonderful to get all these natural ingredients. Yes. And smoke three and dear meat, I think I must have in here. It's almost this. That's smoked reindeer meat. Oh, what a colour. Yes. What, the, oh, the, uh, you know, time? no, it's when they uh, they salt it, and uh, if the, the salt isn't ha hasn't come yet, yeah, right. that, that, that yes. will be mm. that colour when when you smoke it. Right. And, uh, and oh, you can have a yep. look, and then you can guess. Oh, I know. I've heard of. I've heard of them. Ah, oh, oh, they're wonderful. Yes, yes, Thank you. These look wonderful. They look so pretty. You know, when I first heard about cloudberries, I thought to myself, "What a wonderful name!" And um, these are gorgeous. Yes. They're so good. So, what more should we see here in the refrigerator? Yeah, Gravlax, you know. Ah, Gravlax, yes, that's yes. But it's not salmon. Lux, that's, it's, uh, it's not salmon, it's um, uh, uh, shark. Oh, it's not salmon, it's shark. Shark, right, yeah. Char. Okay. But here, it's the same thing with um, elk filet. Gravad elk filet. Gravad elk filet. Gravad elk filet. My word. So it's almost the same. You take, but, but that's not cooked at all. You know. No, no, no. It's so just, just a raw just a elk raw. steak. Yes. Ah. And uh, it's salt and um, sugar, the same of each, and it's nice bread in the middle. And uh, then you can serve it with a sauce of you make of French. Uh, See, mustard. Mustard, mustard. Yes. yes, mustard because, sauce. Because, you know, the, the Swedish is uh, rather sweet, but... Um, yes. Mmm, so. that's very good. Somebody had told me that I was going to be eating raw elk. I don't know that I'd have believed no. them. You must have uh, some menu at your restaurant. Of course, there are people sitting in the restaurant and they just ask, Do, don't you have anything else? Don't you have an ordinary beef? Or, uh, or. But then I, I say, then you can go to the other place up in, in the hill, they have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way to keep that away. I might have failed to get a glimpse of a reindeer, apart from a slice of smoked fat, but an elk I was determined to see. So when I got to Elf Darden, I went on an elk safari. He was standing there like a monument, did not move any, none. So they are very big, aren't they? Oh yeah, yes. Yes, yes, I've seen postcards of them. They yeah. seem to have a lot of postcards. Have you seen them? Of course, yeah. They're rude postcards, actually. Oh, you see no. these? Oh, <laughs> extraordinary. No, no. I don't know. No. There are a lot of them like oh, yeah. this, you know. Mm. It's the way. <laughs> oh, they bring people here. Yes, yeah. Oh, it's a rude animal, the elk. It ought to be ashamed of itself. Actually, it probably was ashamed of itself, which is why it wouldn't come out and be seen by a respectable coach party of tourists. We went through the forest, and then we went back through the forest, and then we went across it, and then we went round it a bit. We were prepared to encounter the elk in any kind of activity, even if it meant having the negatives privately developed. We were ready for it. In fact, we were more than ready for it, no matter what it might choose to indulge in. But it didn't. So we got off. I wondered whether the elk was perhaps at home, attempting to explain itself to the missus. But the nature was very nice, and the company agreeable. We had everything we needed for a promenade. Ha, ha, ha.
The lakeside seemed a likely place for the elk to be exercising its voyeuristic tendencies. Unfortunately, nobody was taking their clothes off at the time. Ah, mosquitoes. Do you get a lot of mosquitoes? It was about this time that goose pimples and scepticism began to set in. I began to wonder whether the elk might be off on a people safari, trying to see us. Anyway, the lewd beast had eluded us, leaving but a single contemptuous trace of its passage. I didn't lose hope of ever seeing an elk, but in the end, it was quite another beast that I saw in the forest. Elk eat the tops of young trees, but this one's appetite was in a different league. The forest is bountiful. It's buried alone, especially cloud birds support a whole black economy the government is powerless to tax. The timber is a national resource whose value goes up every year, so big business understands how important it is to keep it growing. Still, it needs care. In the high forest, a good growing season to establish new trees may only happen 10 or 15 years after you've sent in the tree harvester. This is the last of the trolls, for the moment. Summer and I came into Sweden together. People forgot that it had ever been 40 below zero, put the snowshoes away on the top shelf, stood the skis at the back of the garage, and came out into the sun. It wasn't the kind of warmth you get in the Mediterranean that feels as if it's emerging from within the earth and within the people. This was a radiant heat that shone from the sky and had something of the same clarity and it brought holidays and the end of term concert to the tiny village school at Storsetten. Det är väl lite typisk svensk sommar det här. Regnet hänger men ändå så får vi säga att en vänlig grönskas rika dräkt har smyckat dal och ängar. Högtid, fest, blommor, festklädda barn, förväntansfulla föräldrar. Kanske som vanligt lite nervositet. Ja, då ska vi få lyssna till tre sommarsånger. Karin och Benny, varsågoda och gå fram och ni andra också. In Sweden, they try not to close down country schools simply because they're small. This was the entire school performing. There was a daycare centre for little ones with 15 children and four staff. The Swedes love their children as they love childhood itself. 
For them, the child and the summer are the same. Here is so much connected with the childhood, the summer and swimming and bathing. A lot of fun with the childhood. What are the good things about raising children in Sweden? Oh, I think it's very, very well uh, organized for them physically. That's, that's good. We have uh, come a long way with that. And uh, I think it's, uh, we have a good uh, way of thinking of children. We want to give them opportunity to get educated and make their own choices. The way of raising children is to be a good model for them. That's the way you shouldn't hit them, because if you hit them, it shows that it's OK to do it. My father does it. OK, I can do it also, because what he does is right. So uh, the parents want to be good models for their child, and all the grown-up, I hope, want to be it also. And what's bad about the Swedish way of bringing up children? Well, it's real bad. <laughs> uh, we don't give them enough time, always. We're very conscious about getting them in bed in time, so they are alert in the morning. I know when I was in Spain, the children was with them, the families. There was grandmother and there was grandfather and sister and brother, and everybody was together out together on the restaurants, but here we are taking in a, a little uh, babysitter and going out together. That's nice all, also, but I think it's much better if they spend more time together, the families, and have a fun time. <laughs> the factories that make toys nowadays, they make toys for playing alone, the videos, you're making that alone, and you're sitting more and more apart of each other. So they are not so well trained nowadays, maybe, to uh, play together. So they don't really have community in some families. We have the opportunity to just work six hours a day to be more together with the children. And that's very, very good in Sweden. So we can do it better. Sometimes when I look at Swedish children, they seem to behave in such a rational and reasonable manner that I wonder whether these can be the same children as there are in other parts of the world. They just seem to be too good. No, no, no. no. It is the same children, but they have different opportunities in different countries. But sometimes, when children have too normal a childhood, perhaps in the end they become a little dull. Perhaps it is the things that go wrong with childhood that make interesting people. Might be so, yes. And I think uh, I've been sailing on a, what do you say, shrimp sandwich all the way. <laughs> Everything has went on very well for me. But uh, when you have had a good childhood and very, very nice parents, you get interested in others and want to search and learn more and get out, try to help others if you can do it. She won't have got that eye from an adult. If you see anyone strike a child in Sweden, you're supposed to tell the police. Hey, Sina. Hey, Sina. I didn't even know that there was a Swedish National Day, but when I happened upon it, it was devoted to the other end of childhood. It was graduation day on the green at Mora, and it had something of the atmosphere of a religious procession. get a student cap when you graduate successfully from school. There was an attempt to ban them as being undemocratic, but the Swedes wouldn't have it.
it was a good child's dream of heaven. And the fact that come midnight, a fair number of these young people would be rolling around the streets in a most unangelic manner, did not at that point diminish its innocence. It was sun, flowers, and beautiful youth. And surely it's not possible to have too much of any of these desirables. So what could it be that I was wondering about? I think I was worried because I couldn't understand why it was I couldn't see the troll. Unless all the time it was inside me. Here, the flowers that change almost daily and vividly in the summer meadows positively refuse to stay there, for they fly off like butterflies to alight on national costumes and to decorate the houses, like Eric Larsgården, which was once a farm and is now a cafe, where you can take a cuppa with the Queen of Sheba, King David playing his harp, and Tobias and the Angel, complete with the Angel's dog. The Dalina wall paintings were created by 18th and 19th century village artists, each of whom had his own style of symbolic flower. Here, the goddess of justice makes blossoms into a stairway to heaven. This is Simon wrestling with a lion, with inspiration drawn from Victorian fashion magazines, as with King Solomon, the Queen of Sheba. As I travelled through the province of Dalarna, from the high forest to the coastal plain, I came close to the heart of Sweden, for Dalarna embodies its self-image of a simplicity that belongs to another age. Lake Sillian is far too big to have been made by the toppling of a troll. It was actually formed by the falling of a meteorite, and its traditions are predominantly heavenly. At Leksand, they perform the play of heaven, a kind of Swedish Oberammergau, while at Ratvik, they still sometimes go to church by boat, as they did in the old days all over the north, because there were no roads. While this is no exception to the general definition of any tradition, that is, an event almost entirely surrounded by tourists, the people of Sillian also keep up their customs for themselves, so that you'll sometimes find the same event being repeated more privately for their own benefit. They may be dressing up, but they're not actors. Their ancestors led the fight for freedom against the Danes. Whoever watches them, this is their thing, and a ritual to be taken seriously. The area in which we live, with the um, climate that is cold, it's long winter, it's dark, not like now when the sun is, is up almost all day. It is putting its character of the people. I think that if you listen, for example, to Swedish or to Scandinavian folk music, you might have a clue there. In the southern parts of Sweden, where you have the open fields, there is a more gay tune, more happy tune in, in the, uh, the music. Up here, you are going down to some melancholic uh, tune in, in the folk music, as you have heard today, I think. And I think this is reflecting the inner side of persons. I don't know, maybe it's that we are fairly few people living here in a very big country that this has come and you see if you go up in an airplane all the huge forests here the isolation of people people up in this area they're very proud and have been all the time and they also stick to their traditions nobody should come from outside and tell them here 
what to do and how to do it. When these fiddle tunes were new, it was no easy matter for anyone to come from outside. But like most of the lakes and fjords of Scandinavia, Lake Sillian did not divide people so much as unite them. In their boats, the people came to the Lutheran church because it was the center of their lives. The news, the laws were read out from its pulpit. There were no communications but for the church, no welfare but for its charity. Even the fire brigade was centered on the church because the church had the only bells. But this is breaking up now. Uh, society has taken over all these things that the church had before. Uh, but it could, could give you an idea about that there was a very united society and the church played a very, very important role in that. And now I think the church is sort of um, gliding out of, of the center of power, which I think is important because for a long, long time the ministers were sort of thought of as powerful persons and were very difficult to see as human beings, more or less. So I prefer this life compared to the uh, earlier. Does that leave any role for the church to play? Well, I think so. And, and it, it sure depends on what what kind of um, gifts you think that you are, the church should, should be involved in. I think that um, not so, so long ago, people in this country had to fight for survival as, as well as in other countries. And all the parents wanted their children to be better off than themselves. I think that now we have got a lot of things. And I think that I myself belong to the after Second World War generation has been taught that the meaning of life is to consume things. The more you consume, the better off you are, the happier you are. So you more money, the happier life. But I don't think that's true. And I think that the suicide rate in, in Sweden might indicate something in that way. That now you have had everything, or at least most of the things that you could desire, that you could long for, that isn't enough. So what is life all about? What's the point of being here? I am consuming all these things, but when uh, diseases hits us, when AIDS is coming in, when the problems of the world is coming in, when violence is turning up, killing our prime minister, and so on, I think that we discover many things in our society, violent things, meaningless things, and difficult things. Uh, it's important to be successful and when you are not what is left in, in terms of, of value of human value and i think that the church has an important role to 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 play there and i think that the church is one of the few places if not the only place where you are talking about reconciliation and forgiveness today what about if somebody fails in his career well, he's condemned by society, by everyone, where to, to start again, so to speak. And there I think that in that role, church has quite a lot to do, of saying that there are more things in life than consuming and owning things. it seems that Sweden has everything. It's a rich country, it's a welfare state. I'm wondering if you have such a welfare state because of the influence of the church. I don't know. Um, I think we have a welfare state due to the fact that we have not been in war for 250 years or something like that. We were out from the Second World War. We were never hit by that. We were far in advance compared to other countries in Europe. We had all the factories intact, the machinery intact. So, so I think that rather that is the uh, explanation to, to the welfare state than, than the church. I think you are a lucky society which has been able 
to afford to be innocent. And now, perhaps, you are beginning to face the same problems as the rest of us. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I don't know if we are innocent. Uh, um, I think that it's very easy when you have sold things to be other countries' conscience. And that is a role that, that uh, I feel that many Swedish people have played due to the fact they haven't seen the problem. And if you haven't seen other people's problem, it's very easy to solve them. When you look at present-day Swedish society, are you depressed or are you optimistic? Well, I'm trying to be realistic. Um, it's always difficult to predict the future, isn't it? Um, uh, I think more and more, and, and the, the recent uh, catastrophe of Chernobyl has indicated that, that we are not a country separated from the rest of the world. We are very much um, depending on other countries. Uh, many of our, our nature problems uh, is something that your country are is giving us free without any export taxes or anything. It's coming and killing our trees and our forests and our, our rivers and, and our lakes. So we are dependent on what's happening outside this country. Somebody has said to me that it might be that uh, we are now facing the beginning of the end of our civilization in this part of the world, maybe in the whole world because we are always saying that life costs too much. It's too costly to save energy. It's too costly to defend a clean nature, the thing that we, we live on. And uh, what about if nature collapses? There won't be any fishes in the rivers anymore. Some Indian has said that first when the last tree has died and the last part of the soil is poisoned, when the last fish has died, uh, mankind is going to learn that we cannot eat money. <laughs> it must have been a coincidence, but that night the Sicilian fishers had the sort of catch that they wouldn't be boasting about afterwards. They were after Blikta, a little fish from the lake, a traditional sport on summer evenings. There would have been a few more, but they were inside the pike. Would it be good to eat? Yes. Yeah. Cilion isn't acid. It's limestone there. That's one lake whose life will go on. They still even build church boats, though they use them for racing now. But fishers of men or fishers of fish, even in Sweden, the catch is more and more a question mark. As they say in Darwin, we laugh in a minor key. Thank you.